For this next session, we're going to be focusing on the examination of operational capacity and managing risk tolerance related to organ utilization and performance, uh, really from a transplant center perspective and really at that 50,000 foot uh, level. We have two excellent speakers with us this afternoon. Uh, each are going to take about 15 minutes to present, uh, and they are both then going to join us for a panel discussion and hopefully uh, some rich questions and answers uh, from all of you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Uh, first, uh, from Jackson uh, Memorial, uh, we have Luke Prasevsky. Luke is the Vice President of Transplant there at Jackson Memorial. And our second speaker is going to be Paul Myung. Paul currently is the Senior Administrative Director in the Transplant Center at the Massachusetts General Hospital. In addition, he also serves as a Chair of the Board of Directors for the Alliance. Both have outstanding growth stories to share with us, and I would first like to welcome Luke to the stage. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks as well to the planning committee uh, for the uh, for this this great seminar. Uh, as uh, as Rick said, our, our goal really is to engage in discussion here. So I'm going to try to keep this. Uh, uh, keep this quick and uh, and go through uh, some of the experience that we've had at uh, at Jackson Health System, uh, Miami Transplant Institute. Can you get the next slide, please? So I do I don't have any conflicts and won't be discussing uh, any FDA regulated drugs or devices. Next slide. Uh, so as a, as a quick background, the Miami Transplant Institute is a collaborative endeavor between Jackson Health System which is the, uh, the county hospital system for Miami-Dade County, one of the largest public hospital systems in the United States, and the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine, which handles the academic arm of our program. Uh, last year, we were the largest transplant center in the United States and the largest multi-organ center uh, in the United States, and we, we pride ourselves on being able to do uh, all kinds of adult and pediatric transplants, including the multiviscerals and combinations and, and things like that. We really motivate ourselves around the idea that the biggest problem uh, that faces patients with end-stage organ failure is the lack of organs for transplantation. And so uh, I think that aligns well with, uh, with what you guys are talking about throughout this, this forum here and, and all the work that, uh, that this group has, has done over the years. But we're really, uh, we're believers that, uh, that that's the biggest issue we have and we work very hard to address that. So uh, I, I apologize for that background noise. There's some construction going on that's unexpected. Um, so uh, if we get the next slide, please. I'm also gonna see if I can get that stopped. I don't know how distracting it is. Um, so, uh, you know, as I said, our, our, our approach is that the, the biggest enemy is not enough organs. Uh, and uh, the, um, you know, the, the approach that we've taken is to try to be innovative uh, and that, uh, you know, that our teams have to come together around the idea of not just saying, not just saying yes to organs, but finding new ways to make them successful. As we all know, and that's some of what we're going to talk about today, there is real risk to, uh, you know, to, to an organization from taking some of the, the chances that we take, and we want to make sure that we're handling that carefully. So, uh, we really come in with the idea that we're going to advocate on public policy uh, to make things better. Uh, we're going to innovate on how we practice, uh, and, and in so doing, we'll be able to continue our leadership in the nation, and much more important than that, uh, offer the best we can to every single patient that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, and so I want to share, you know, uh, when I talk about this idea of innovating, uh, that's that's fairly natural for all of us in the academic space, I think, uh, in the in the notion that we're going to do research, and certainly that's a part of what we do. But one of the things that I think is extremely important here is that we're also part of a health system, and uh, hospitals and health systems are naturally somewhat conservative organizations, and finding ways to build innovative, aggressive businesses inside of an established company is not always a straightforward thing to do. And it's particularly true when you get into this concept uh, of potential risk aversion. And so 
Uh, there's a great article uh, from uh, Govinda Rajan and, and Trimble in uh, Harvard, Harvard Business Review. Now, it's 15 years old. I've been using it forever. But uh, they studied this at a lot, at a lot of uh, big, big organizations, you know, known places, New York Times, Corning, Hasbro, et cetera, uh, places that you've all heard of. And how, uh, with such established, successful businesses, did they find ways to innovate? And uh, so they, in investigating kind of a deep dive in those organizations, how did they build innovative programs inside the uh, inside established businesses? They really found that there were three critical best practices. The first is forgetting, and so the idea is that you need to, uh, you know, to be willing to break away from the core business, uh, and that even means f- being willing to break away from things that have been successful. And so there are things that that make your organization successful. And if you want to be able to be truly innovative in transplantation, you're going to need to leave, be willing to leave a little bit of that behind. Uh, second then, once you've kind of gotten through that idea that you're not gonna commit yourself necessarily to the things that have been successful, you do wanna borrow and you do wanna say, well, well, now wait a second, there's a reason the place has been successful. And some of the things that have happened here that have made us successful uh, are are useful to us. So as important as it is to make that break and to tell the team, don't be held back by the organization, what it has been and what else it's doing. Don't forget the the overall fact that the success of the organization is a huge asset to us. And so when there are things that the, that the organization are particularly good at, those represent your unique strengths. And those are things that may give you an upper hand over uh, over competition. This was extremely important in these types of organizations because in a lot of cases, they may have been competing with startups. And so there are people who are, are startup organizations. If you want to compete with them, uh, you should leverage the things that you have, but it's a good lesson for all of us. And then learning is, is kind of completing that picture. So you've cleared the slate a little bit, you've borrowed what you can, and then you've said, well, but if we want to be successful, these are the things we have to do. Uh, that we've got to figure out now and really focus your team's energy on that learning process and filling in those those gaps. And in our case, we really believe that's what are the organs that are out there that are not being used today that we can use tomorrow. Next slide, please. Uh, so you can see this is just a, a year-by-year transplants, and it's a, a stacked bar graph of the different organ types. And you can see the growth we've had. For quite a while, we were running uh, between four and 500 organ transplants a year. Uh, and you can see over the last few years, we've been able to grow that to, uh, to where we did 747 transplants in uh, 2019. And the orange uh, at the bottom represents kidney transplants. And as we'll, I'm going to focus a little bit on that, although the other organs are important. Um, but the uh, the kidneys, where we've seen the biggest growth, and I think is the best example that we that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, so you can see, you know, last year we did we did just over 500 kidney transplants, uh, which made us the the most in the in the country and the most that anybody has has ever done. Uh, and next slide, please. And you can see where we've grown. And so this slide is only the deceased donor kidneys. It does not include living donor kidneys. Our big growth has not been in living donor. It's been in deceased donor kidneys. And you can see here that the number of organs we've gotten locally has actually gone down during the time of our growth. That is not because uh, of our of our OPO. Um, that's because uh, Cleveland Clinic opened a center, a kidney center that has been growing at the same time that we have, and so we've had to share the local organs that have been available to us with more local competition. But despite that, we've been able to grow, and we've been able to do that by uh, by importing organs. And so we've been able to find around the country partners in OPOs who can identify those kidneys that local centers. Uh, are not willing or able to use, but that we believe we have a chance of being able to use successfully. Next slide, please. So I wanna talk specifically, as we've undertaken that effort and been successful in that, what are the risk categories that we're really trying to to address within the organization? And and I'm sort of lumping those into uh, a few categories. One is is regulatory uh, and public relations. This is kind of where the, you know, changes in outcomes, uh, that can occur as well as specific uh, specific adverse events that that might attract attention. You know, a lot of places would call this the reputational risk. Uh, there could be situations where 
uh, you know, where we, if we, if we have an outcomes dip, not only might that get bad publicity for the transplant center, it could taint the overall reputations of the organizations that support us. And so we want to make sure that we're managing to that. Uh, financial risk is significant. Some of that can flow from the first, whether that be uh, loss of business, loss of insurance contracts, et cetera. But additionally, as you can imagine, the types of uh, organs that we're importing are more costly for us to use. We, being successful at this requires that we be willing to uh, discard kidneys that we can't successfully transplant. I'm proud to tell everybody that we're the largest importer of deceased donor kidneys in the United States, but that also comes with the fact that we are the largest discarder of kidneys in the United States. And that's because we bring in kidneys that we believe we can use but if we look at that kidney on the pump and we decide that it's not usable, we're not shy about being willing to get rid of that because that's an, a critical uh, aspect of mitigating this risk to us. Uh, and But there's a cost that's associated with that. And there's a cost that's associated with the, the OPO that sends it to us as well, which really makes that relationship extremely important. Uh, capacity and internal competition is always an issue. As you can imagine, this type of growth means that we are consuming a much larger share of organizational resources, such as inpatient beds, uh, money and people, et cetera. And so uh, I think Paul's going to talk a little bit about this. He sees this at an even uh, more extensive level, I think, at, at Mass General, where uh, where every program is expected to be a, a national leader. Uh, I, you know, I am uh, blessed to be in a in a place like Jackson, where uh, uh, you know they're happy to have the transplant program as kind of a flagship program. And we see there's a few programs that really are are operating at that national leadership level, as opposed to the expectation that everybody on campus will. Uh, and fatigue burnout among staff is is very important as well. What we do is hard. Uh, it's it's it. The easier thing to do would be not try to get some of these organs in, not try to get that patient in quickly and figure out how to make it transplantable. And so we wear everybody out a little bit uh, by, by doing what we've done. Next slide, please. You know, th this shows you that the, the graph on the uh, left side of the slide here is our SRTR report on uh, aggressiveness of offer, offer acceptance. You can see, obviously, in the kidney program, we are an outlier in the types of kidneys that we're willing to accept. That has uh, comes with a number of things that are different about the transplants we're doing. Uh, fortunately, you know, the benefit of this is being conveyed uh, disproportionately to uh, historically less served population. So uh, the population of our recipients is, is less white, uh, more Hispanic, and older than the U.S. average. And so we're, we're helping people that have had trouble getting transplants in the past. On the deceased donor side, you can see we are using considerably older donors. Uh, we are using considerably more organs from outside our local DSA. And, you know, 80% of our kidneys have a cold time longer than 32 hours. The national average on that is 15%. Uh, those things come with costs and risks. Uh, I don't have to tell anybody on this call. And so we have to be, be ready to handle those things. And, and specific to some cost drivers, you can see we run a much higher than average delayed graft function rate. Uh, and we run a little bit of a longer length of stay. And those present real costs to the organization that we have to make sure that, we, that everybody's ready to handle. Next slide, please. So what are the ways we mitigate these risks? Uh, mo first and foremost, no question about it, is communication and expectation. So if you surprise an organization, if you surprise members of your team by doing, by, by growing, by being aggressive, uh, it's it's going to go hard when things when things get challenging and things will get challenging. So we're very upfront about what we're doing, why we're doing it. It's so critical for people to understand. Really changing the entire frame, uh, and that's where we get back to that mission of of the fact that we should be finding ways to get more transplants done. And importantly addressing what I call this time zero uh, fallacy, where we act like the performance of organs ought to be compared to an average transplant. That's assuming that an average transplant is available for everybody on the list. And everybody here knows that's not true. We need to be comparing transplants to the alternative, which in the case of kidney is remaining on dialysis. In the case of, uh, of pancreas, it's uh, you know, remaining with, with dysfunctional blood sugar. And in the case of the other organs, frankly, it's, it's a fairly near-term death. And so we need to keep our, our eyes on the prize of making sure that that's, that's where we, we understand our expectations to be. 
if you look at it as, oh, our DGF rate is high, well, who cares, right? Frankly, a lot of our patients were on dialysis before. Now, if the kidney never functions, we didn't do anybody a favor, and we need to learn from that. But if the kidney does not function for a few weeks, that is a considerably better outcome than leaving that patient on dialysis for several more years until a supposedly better kidney appears. Leadership alignment is obviously essential. It's, it's, it's so important to have buy-in from the top level of the organization. And again, to have them understand this, it's a big educational job. I actually largely regard a lot of this as my job here. Uh, I, I make My team is well aware that I don't actually do anything useful around the MTI. Uh, and so my job here is to make sure that the, that the senior organization uh, leaders know what we're doing um, know why we're doing it, and that they stay out of the way and provide us the support we need so that our excellent team can run their race and be successful. Uh, monitoring and transparency is essential. We need to know uh, how, when we take these risks, how's it going? Are we causing problems? And we need to be transparent with that with the leaders and team members, one, so that they can change their decision making on the fly, and two, so that everybody knows whether we're doing the right thing. Investment is critical. Uh, if you're successful at this, you, you will generate more contribution margin for the organization, but you have to make sure that you actually get the people you need to support this and the facilities you need. In, in, my, in my few years here, we've been able to add a new $15 million clinic that allows us to expedite care and keep patients out of the hospital and the ED. We've obtained another inpatient floor on top of the two we already had, and we're in the process of constructing an additional 54 intensive care beds. That type of investment is what's required to support what we're doing here and to continue to grow. And it needs to be a frank trade. If the organization is not willing to support the investment necessary, you shouldn't grow anyway uh, and, and do it wrong because you will, you will fail. It's critical to offset with benefits because the reality is these risks, some of these risks will materialize. Some of these downsides will actually happen. And it's important to show what the upside has been because all of them have a similar offset. A reputational risk, yes, you can have a negative uh, event come from a, a dip in, uh, in outcomes or something like that. But at the same time, uh, being successful is, is extremely powerful for your reputation. The marketing department can run stories of successful transplants that you were able to do and things like that. And so we need to make sure that everybody understands that just as powerful as the downside is the upside. And you need to embrace failure. It's absolutely critical. You're not going to be successful all the time. Don't throw good money after bad. If you do something and it doesn't work, be willing to admit that, own that, say, hey, we tried, it was the right, it was the right thing to try. Now we're going to stop and, and not chase it down. If it's not working, we're going to make that change and, and have everybody understand that failure is, is a critical part of continuing to be successful. Next slide. This is my last slide, and I just want to share with you, you know, one group of kidneys that we've used, and it shows you some of the risks and benefits here. Uh, in donors with acute kidney injury, uh, which we define based on sort of the CKD, AKI stages, you can see that when we take an AKI kidney, it has double the delayed graft function rate of our non-AKI kidneys. That means the patient's in the hospital a little longer, we're paying for dialysis, we have to manage expectations with the community on that and everything else. But the question is, is that worth it? And you can see here uh, in an internal series of 694 consecutive transplants comparing uh, at our organization, comparing the GFRs at uh, three months in blue, six months in pink and one year in green, the, the GFRs and the recipients is indistinguishable even by three months. I actually expected that that wasn't going to level out till six. And so, yes, there's an early price to pay with the DGF, but that's worth getting over because at the end of the day, we got more people transplanted and they're showing similar graph function down the road to patients who got the supposedly standard better kidneys. And this is, this is why we do it. Transparency on that shows why we do it and why we should continue to do it. Thanks very much. That's, uh, that's it. I'm not going to take any questions now. I believe we're going to wait till the end and do questions as a, as a group after Paul's excellent talk. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Great. Thanks, Luke. Great presentation. Um, hi, everybody. So uh, I'm going to go over a little bit about um, how we've approached sort of the changing landscape at Mass General. Would you go to the next slide, please? And I have no financial relationships to disclose.
Next slide. So um, as Luke mentioned about all the changes that have been going on, not just within our general United States healthcare system, but also within transplant, I'll be talking a little bit about how we've approached uh, the changing external landscape at Mass General, as well as um, sharing the experience that we've had internally within our organization um, within MGH, as well as a part of our corporate organization, Mass General Brigham. I'm going to focus more on the how at this time and reserve um, our Q&A session to really more discuss the, the what of how we've sort of approached this. Uh, next slide. This is a quick snapshot of Mass General and also the MGH Transplant Center. As you can see on the left, MGH, we're um, a thousand plus bed hospital uh, responsible for quite a lot of volumes, about 50,000 inpatient admissions, uh, 870,000 outpatient visits, um, over 100,000 uh, ER visits, 45,000 operations, over 300 transplants a year, as well as we um, carry around 2,600 um, employees. Um, we are also affiliated with the Harvard Medical School. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, we are uh, uh, underneath the corporate umbrella of Mass General Brigham, which was formerly Partners Healthcare, which was formed in 1994. We're currently number six on the US World News Report, for various reasons. And then as far as the Mass General Transplant Center, uh, we're the largest and most comprehensive uh, transplant center in New England. Uh, we consecutively perform, as I mentioned, 300 plus uh, transplants a year. We perform the second uh, DCD heart in the country and also our Center for Transplantation Sciences carries the largest uh, research budget within our department. Next slide. And so as mentioned before, I'm gonna be really focusing on like the 50,000 foot level, kind of going from the external and then going uh, further down into kind of what this means at MGH. Um, I'm not gonna go through too much here, but really as many of you all know, there are a lot of external forces out there. Um, there's a lot of further consolidation in our healthcare systems. Now we have Optum, which is a payer, as many of you know, um, as the largest uh, owner of, uh, phys of physicians in the country at this time, I believe 8,000 um, more physicians than Kaiser themselves. Uh, many of us are experiencing the accelerated digital healthcare revolution, as well as um, patient consumerism, and the list goes on. But I'm really just gonna focus at this time really on the expanding clinical use of organs. As many of you may remember, uh, when HIVs and the HOPE Act came out, we, were, uh, we at MGH were the first in New England to really engage in that uh, initiative. Uh, same thing with HCV, uh, DCD hearts, as I mentioned before, and also I'm, I'm happy to discuss the liver component as well um, in the Q&A session. And culturally, as well as philosophically, we at MGS really are trying to focus on the long game. And so we have invested a lot of time, effort, and resources into really um, looking into the various ways for us to actively, in a controlled manner, address the organ supply problem. And so we've looked into xenotransplantation, specifically around CRISPR technology, as well as bioengineering of those organs. And I'm happy to share kind of our experiences during the Q&A afterwards. And here's just a quick little um, quote uh, by Epictetus, uh, one of the old Stoics about kind of really focusing on what you can control and, what, and let the things that you can't control sort of exist and how do you sort of move towards a better way to control and to actively approach the things that you that are within your um, realm of control. Next slide. This is a quick sort of um, kind of a very high level, as I mentioned before, kind of the things that we've been doing at the Mass General uh, Transplant Center. And I always like to say, keep it simple and temporary, simply because there's a lot of things anti-simple and anti-temporary at Mass General. Uh, simple, um, simply because complexity is very, very easy to do. Um, especially within our world, complexity seems like it's the name of the game. However, we do need to really focus on internally on what are those small things that are very meaningful, but also have high importance and that we can start controlling and really investing our resources, our time and our attention into and really making that a, a main priority. Also, um, as, as uh, Luke mentioned before, kind of forgetting the past, if you will, but we've really focused on engendering a temporary mindset. Uh, really because you know it's really important for us to get through all of these challenges together especially in a changing time and we need to be able to anticipate that um and also if you kind of think further about uh you know all the things that we put into business plans i've sort of joked with my cfo all the time where he said you know i've never seen a bad business plan come to my desk but i've never seen a good risk mitigation plan and so 
we've always talked about how, and I believe there's a Warren Buffett quote about, you know, put all of your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. And so we've sort of adopted the same approach, really focusing on what are those key drivers, those key risks that we really need to focus on and set our goals and our targets there versus really looking at the numbers because those will materialize as, as to the plan. Uh, going a little bit further, uh, really balancing emergent and deliberate strategies, uh, just to be a little bit um, more kind of um, clarifying on what that really means, is really just to embrace setbacks um, and prepare for them. Really do pre-mortem exercises because, you know, before we go into launching new programs, launching new projects, we really have to anticipate that there will be challenges and there will be risks and we need to be prepared for them. And so we've sort of taken this deliberate approach around first setting the direction strategically and then creating more of a dynamic living strategic plan, which incorporates the emergent strategies that come as we do things along over time. And then also making that more of a deliberate strategy and then creating processes around that so that we actually have, uh, you know, an actual review cycle. Uh, previously, to me, I think we our strategic planning cycle was about five to six years. We've moved that down to roughly about every quarter. Um, and then, you know, obviously, as we make progress, we kind of, um, you know, have extended that to biannual strategic plan reviews. Um, and so we've sort of created that more as a strategic asset and using time and actually making it um, something that we um, have a regular cadence uh, that's not a five-year cycle, but now it's more um, real time. And then lastly, it's just really avoiding confirmation bias. It's very easy for us to put things on paper, um, execute on a plan and feel like everything is going to be okay and taking our eye off the ball or not really understanding what are the additional risks or what are the changing risks that have come over the past you know, year or two. So really being deliberate about that and avoiding confirmation bias and creating a, a sense of continuous strategic improvement, as I mentioned before, making a part of our culture, talking about it, thinking about it versus seeing it more as this pie in the sky or motherhood and apple pie sort of goals, which I'm sure many of our uh, transplant centers share a lot of the same strategic priorities. So it's really just to kind of think about um, using time and continuous strategic improvement uh, for our benefit. And uh, as you know, I think our modern day philosopher, Mike Tyson would say, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. So prepare for the punches. Next slide. And so this is a very busy slide and it was on purpose just to show everyone sort of all of the things that are going on in our internal environment here at Mass General. So within our organization and some of the priorities, as Luke mentioned, uh, we have a lot of short-term and long-term goals which you know, are great independent of uh, some of the other you know, um, large centers. We have a very large cancer center here, a heart center, a digestive healthcare center. But really is how do you make sure that we are relevant in that conversation, but make sure we also are at the table when it comes down to resource allocations. That's uh, human resources, that's capital resources, and as I mentioned too, time. Um, and there, since there are so many competing priorities, we need to be very thoughtful and strategic internally on how we approach the opportunities. And I'll give you an example, and as I'm sure everyone can kind of look at the logos here, but here on the left, uh, that's our Bullfinch building. That was the site of our first hospital in 1811. Sometimes people still talk about 1811 and the Etherdome. However, we're moving more towards the future of what do we ultimately need? How do we address sort of the advancement of technology and look at it operationally as well? And so as you can see here on the right, this is a uh, rendering of a two tower, $2 billion hospital addition to our campus. And that will be coming in 2027. And so how do you manage the cultures? How do you manage the needs? And especially now with so many things accelerating due to uh, COVID and some of the other um, technologies that we've been able to um, or leaned on, how do we still stay relevant um, to this day? Next is really the inter-organizational uh, initiatives. As I mentioned before, we're part of a large uh, corporate entity, uh, Mass General Brigham. It was recently rebranded. Uh, we are uh, um, one uh, member of an 11 hospital system with two rehab centers. And as you can uh, read here, a lot of other um, uh, partners and community health centers. But how do we think about this together, as well as independently thinking about our strategy? And so um, over the last couple of years, uh, we've started to think more actively versus passively about what does this mean to be part of a single 
organization. And Mass General Brigham has now moved more or moved away from a, a holding company, if you will, and now moved into more of an operating company. So as I mentioned, change will come, the punches will come. Now we have to actively be strategic about what we do and how we approach it. Um, as I mentioned before, aligning incentives and retaining a rel relevancy quotient is very important to us. Um, we we um, you know, have a healthy relationship with many of our various um, you know, centers internally to MGH, but also at the Brigham. And we are actively uh, looking at um, partnership that makes sense, but also working together around a lot of collaborative opportunities that may not have presented themselves based off our previous history. And then lastly, it's really the energy management piece. How do you start looking at energy as far as what you resource, what you focus on, what you impact in the potential energy phase or the kinetic energy phase? And so we've always thought about what's in queue, what's on deck, how do we still resource those things so that by the time opportunity presents themselves, it switches over to, to kinetic energy and we focus and we implement and we move forward. And so as Clay Christensen, as many of you know him, has said strategy is not what I, uh, you say it is. It is nothing but good intentions unless it's effectively implemented. So that's how we've sort of approached uh, internally at MGH, um, a lot of these various changes um, that have come our way. And we're really trying to look for uh, areas of change that we're going to be leading in the near future. Um, and again, uh, we'll reserve a lot of the how you, or the what that we've been doing in the Q&A session. Next slide. And I believe that's my last slide. This is our team uh, during our last Donate Life Month and um, open for questions. Thanks everybody for uh, that great talk uh, by, uh, by Paul and by Luke. Uh, we really appreciate everyone's uh, attendance and we've got a number of questions in the queue. I want to just start out with a few of my own before we hit the queue, but I encourage uh, the audience to uh, ask questions uh, as, as we go here. We've got some time. We've got really two experts in this field. Um, and, and I'm going to, this question is really going to be posed for both Paul and Luke. Um, and the, the first one before we get into this one is actually just for Luke. Uh, we did want to know if that was a, the new transplant wing being built in the background uh, as as your talk was. Given yeah, I, I'd love to say it was some really exciting investment like that. What it, it actually is, is uh, we, um, we're having to relocate the temporary COVID triage clinic that we that we built. And so that's a sink installation so that we can continue our, our COVID triage. So that's that's more adapting on the fly rather than some some exciting new investment. So um, for both of you, Ed, you know, you both are practicing at some uh, two larger, two rather large uh, transplant centers. And uh, as you can um, imagine in our audience, we have both large centers and uh, small ones who want to be large. What what advice uh, can you give um, a smaller center who's trying to think think about mitigating some of the risk that they may be taking, particularly as we talk about organs, you know, that might be on that margin? Well, I think you know, I, I think the 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 most important thing along those lines is to is to realign those expectations right because you're you if you start to use some organs that previously you, you wouldn't have you're going to have some not go great you're going to have things like more dgf you're going to get the call from a referring uh, nephrologist in the community why is my patient back on dialysis i send them to get them off dialysis all that lay the groundwork with the expectations of what it is you're doing uh, and and why and then the, the other thing i would say is is go slow particularly if you're uh, if you're at a smaller place, you know, uh, it's it's one thing for us to grow in the absolute numbers that 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 we have on a basis of of having been established at doing four or five hundred transplants a year. Uh, if you're doing thirty, you know, doing thirty five the next year is amazing. That's a tremendous success story. Don't sweat the fact that you're not anywhere near large yet. You don't go from 30 to 100. You go from 30 to 35 to 40 to 50. You know, it's it's an incremental process. And those those if you take off those bites, you can chew those. If you set your sights on uh, on an unrealistic number, you'll you'll make mistakes and you'll get 
disheartened because it's not it's not realistic. Thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, I agree with Luke, but also um, you know even though we're both from large centers as well as a large academic medical center. It's not like it's Lake Wobegon here. It's not like every organ program is, you know, good looking and above average. Uh, we do have some smaller organ programs. We do, as I mentioned before, we do pediatric abdominal transplants, and we still suffer that same challenge in managing the small list, managing those marginal organs. But we still apply the same principles that um, our large kidney transplant program, which is uh, the true volume driver, they, um, you know, have the luxury in being a little bit more selective and uh, in managing that risk. So I would just say a lot of the things that we'll probably share later on today, um, try to look at applying those principles that we're, we'll be sharing. And how does that apply to your culture? How does that apply to your, uh, the appetite of your leadership <laughs> at the hospitals that um, you're, you're at? And really, is, is growth really the thing that is a marker of success? Or is it really just something that um, we are all obviously um, you know, trying to do? And so I would just get some clarity around that and also know that you know, there's a lot of core principles that um, apply to every transplant program, whether it's small, medium, or large. Great. Uh, you both talked a little bit about organ selection. Uh, and there's a lot of variability, as David Goldberg had uh, talked a little bit about in his uh, presentation on um, acceptance by transplant centers, uh, a different variability. I'd imagine within each of your uh, organ-specific programs, there's also variability surgeon by surgeon. And so um, how do you look at that from a selection uh, of an organ standpoint and try to reduce as much as you can the variability that occurs within the program, uh, and what tools uh, do you guys use uh, to make that happen? Do you want to go first, Luke? You go ahead. Go ahead. I took the last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, I mean, from a transplant administrator's perspective, is working with every clinician. And um, it's important to get the, the surgical uh, directors on board, but also the medical directors. And know that it takes time and there needs to be reps involved and making sure that you can support them, but also challenge them as far as making sure certain organs are being reviewed that are turned down, um, monitoring the, the outcomes of those that you may have uh, taken the more marginal organs on or transplanted uh, higher quality organs into, um, into uh, more sick, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, patients and making sure that you, this is a dynamic uh, effort that we're moving forward with. And I think every transplant program around the country is dealing with the same thing and uh, making sure that we as leaders, um, both internally and within our region, are trying to do that specifically is to lead and to keep it moving forward. And so I would just say for us, it's really just to keep, keep on our focus on how do we adjust and how do we utilize our organs that are offered to us in the best manner possible and to, to keep our focus on that. Great. Thanks, Paul. So I, I, agree, you know, I agree with the things that Paul said, uh, exactly right. And, and what I would add is you know, something that I've learned in, in my career is, uh, and this pains me to say as an administrator and as an engineer by background, uh, but embrace variability. There is this tendency to say, we need to be able to get everybody together and agree on you know, what patient will do and what organ will do. And for patients, you kind of have to, because it's not fair to put somebody on your list if, you know, if 80% of your surgical staff would, would not be willing to take them to the operating room. But when it comes to organs, you don't. And, um, and the reason I say that is because if you try to, you will then be standardizing around your most conservative surgeon. And if, if you say, we have to get everybody to agree, you are going, you are going, that is going to be less aggressive than your more aggressive team members would be. And so you have to use some of that internal variation as how you test. Some of your surgeons are going to be willing to do some things that others aren't. So let them do it. Within reason, you have to put scope around it. You, as, as Paul said, you've got to get your, your medical leadership on vol, involved. I would never want to do a kidney just because one of the surgeons thought it was an okay idea, but the nephrologist didn't. But if the, if the surgeon and the nephrologist think this is worth a shot, then it's worth a shot. 
do it, see how it goes, make sure the consent's there, and most importantly, track how it goes, because it needs to be one of those things that you quickly decide, oh, actually, this is right, and then the, uh, the colleagues can learn from what, what's happened there, or you can say, no, the crazy guys tried something crazy and it didn't go well, let's make sure that never happens again. And people in this field want to do these things for the right reasons. They don't want to give people organs that don't end up working. So they're, they're willing to rapidly learn, but to be honest, you don't innovate by reaching consensus on how aggressive you're willing to be, in my experience. Great. All right, this is a question uh, from one of our attendees uh, coming in anonymous. Uh, and this is for you, Luke. Uh, how do you see the changes in kidney allocation impacting your program? And what are the top two initiatives your team has established to make your program successful that could be quickly replicated by other programs of varying sizes? Sure. So uh, I could spend the rest of the afternoon complaining about the new allocation system. I have very, very strong feelings about that, as you know, Rick. Um, but uh, but it is it's it's the it's it's what's coming, and we have to adapt to that. Now, I would say that if you're using organs that other people don't want to use, those are going to be av available regardless of the allocation scheme, right? So we're not we're not large because there's so many local organs that go to us. We're large because we use the organs that other people don't want to use, and unless the other people start deciding that they can use them too, they'll continue to come to us and, and support that volume. But um, what I do think is, is most concerning to me about this, this change in allocation system is that it's going to start adding a lot of cold time to kidneys. I think, you know, I think it's, it's going to make the OPO's jobs an awful lot harder uh, as you get through the process of, of working through all this allocation and now having to allocate not in the, to the centers you're used to, also you know, having more people uh, decline and get through that process and take the time to do that. And I, I have a lot of fear about adding uh, cold time to organs. And as you saw, we're willing to be aggressive in the cold time with 80% of our organs having a cold time uh, longer than 32 hours. But that also means that 80% of our organs are already near the limit. And so if, you, if, if, if this allocation system increases the cold time uh, even uh, just a little bit, that's going to be a particularly acute problem for us because it's going to cross kidneys into the range where we can we can no longer use them. And that's been an area of focus of preparation for us is we need to find ways to get that cold time reduced here. So we're working on what can we do to get patients in the hospital faster. Uh, we're, we're looking at, you know, w uh, whether we can move the, the pumping infrastructure uh, next to the operating room. We, we want to kind of tighten our operations because while, um, while we only control the last mile, uh, even if we could shave a few hours out of that, that might help us with the fact that we might be able to take a kidney uh, that's, that's coming in even a little later than some of the ones that we've, that we've brought in. And I, I would encourage everybody to be thoughtful about, about their impact on on cold time. And if your operating room has been resistant to starting a case at three in the morning and wants to wait till seven, well, if that's gonna time a kidney out, you need to deal with that now and have them ready to go in at three because that's that's when it's gonna be possible to, to get this done. Great. Thanks, Lou, appreciate that comprehensive answer. Um, Paul, this one is from Anonymous for you. Uh, they say that culture eats strategy. Uh, and so what, specific things are you doing to improve that culture and how has COVID-19 um, uh, affected uh, some of the culture? Right, no, great question. Um, but also culture is a, a component of strategy as well, right? And so for us, we've really uh, looked at our culture here uh, at MGH and driving towards the ultimate strategy. And I'll give you an example. So. As I mentioned before, with xenotransplantation, bioengineering of organs, looking at uh, various technologies that we want to leverage for organ preservation, and expanding on and actually jumping off from that foundational culture of innovation to how do we make this an actual strategic initiative. So we've used culture in a positive way, uh, leveraging all of the things and the resources that we have in order to do so. However, there are certain areas that culture has eaten uh, some of our strategy or maybe have pulled our prioritization or our focus away from certain strategic um, initiatives and goals. Yet, 
even though it does so, we need to still pivot. We still need to change. We still need to be thoughtful. And you know, even though an active strategy might move from that kinetic energy to the potential, at some point there will be the right time within our culture where this will be the the next sort of um, investment, or this will be the next priority uh, in that queue. And for example, as I mentioned, uh, there will always be changes, and with even within our own organization, which was previously Partners Healthcare, which is now MGB Mass General Brigham, uh, we need to start thinking about this actively and combining our cultures, one that are deep in history and rooted in such, but know that. We're different people. We have different initiatives. We can actually, uh, you know, go over the line or go across the city and actually have a meaningful conversation about what can we do together, what haven't we done in the past because of our cultures, and create um, a different dynamic moving forward. So I would say, in a long-winded way, culture, we're trying to leverage that culture to change the culture and also adjusting our strategy so that it truly leverages the, the positives in the cultures we live in, within Mass General, within the Brigham, as well as Mass General Brigham. And uh, have there been any uh, issues during the COVID time with telemedicine or or staff working remotely that uh, had made that a little bit more of a challenge for for you and your team? Oh, absolutely. Uh, And not only was it challenging around, you know, managing the existing team, but it's also challenging given that the organization has competing needs, right? We had to redeploy all of our staff. We were still doing transplants. Uh, There was a big push for so many various initiatives. And at some point we had to uh, work within the system, but also, uh, you know, stand up our own sort of initiatives um, on the transplant side, because obviously we want to uh, continue to support our staff, but uh, working remotely has been uh, a challenge. Uh, Getting the technology to, to stick has been also a uh, work in progress, but I think we've come a long way. And um, we're here to also, you know, share our best practices across our um, our various, uh, you know, different service lines and um, our different organizations that we work with. Uh, even to the point where we've actually thought about, you know, do we stop doing outreach clinics? And really looking at the way we're leveraging and also managing the changing appetite for patients and the ex- uh, expectations that they have for getting care closer to home. Now it's getting care in their home. So how do we really start focusing on leveraging that and leapfrogging to move forward versus seeing how do we still kind of work within the bounds of essentially just you know geographically fixed outreach clinics? Great. Thanks, Paul. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a question from Kevin O'Connor, and this is uh, directed at both of our speakers. Uh, besides increasing the supply of organs, what can OPOs do more of, better of, or differently to help the patients in your programs? And Luke, why don't you start first, then we'll go to Paul. Sure. Thanks, Kevin. A great question. Uh, you know, I think uh, I, I mentioned, obviously, as the allocation changes are are coming up, doing everything we can to partner on the reduction of cold time. I think is going to be particularly uh, imp- important in all these in all these organs. These these changes, we've seen it in liver, we've seen it in thoracic, and we're 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 going. You know, we're going to see it even more now in kidney, where they're flying commercial, right? So we we don't even control the the planes at this point. So the 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 best thing, uh, you know, one of the best things you guys can do is help us manage. Uh, manage that cold time and and work with the centers to be willing to say we need to get no answers faster so that we can move on. It's not personal or anything else, but to really push your centers to say, it, it, particularly if it's an organ, you know that that based on history, they're not very likely to take and that somebody else is. That's okay. It's no slight against anybody, but you need to be able to push them to move on uh, with, with that because I, I'm going to be really sad if as we get into the new allocation system, we have to, you know, we have organs that we're saying, well, we would have taken this five hours ago. Uh, you know, if we're saying we would have taken it two days ago, maybe there's nothing you can do, right? But if it's if it's one that's, that's, that's a closer call, I think we're going to be we're going to be disappointed by by having to lose on those those oppor- opportunities. Uh, secondarily, I would just say communication and information. That's what, and it relates to that first item. It's what allows them and us to to make those uh, decisions earlier. And so, the earlier we know things, even if unofficially, uh, it's it's helpful. And at a center like ours, where we are working to import organs and we are looking 
to to you know to take that risk and go down. Call us early. Call us and warn us that you know you're not getting an offer right now, but you know, but if it, the way things are playing out, you're guessing that we're going to, and let our you know let our on call team know that this is coming, and maybe they can start to look at our list for it if it's a if it's a narrow type of recipient we're looking for to see if we have somebody if it's a matter of operationalizing uh resources here uh that we can do that or getting if we need to get some agreement or input from physicians they can start doing that before the offer comes in uh it's an unfair ask the system you know shouldn't require that but the reality is if if you want us to be able to to maybe say yes to something that other people have said no to the earlier and the more we know that the the more successful will be in trying to give it a home great thanks Luke. Paul? yeah great question kevin um I would say maybe two things. One is around sort of a reciprocal relationship and I'll, I'll unpackage that. So one would be, you know, we have a great relationship with our OPO, New England Donor Services, and anytime that they need something or anytime we need something, we have a great relationship in that fashion. However, you know, we're a partner to them also to help guide and help sort of share some of our best practices and cross pollinate that within our transplant centers in New England as well. So knowing that New England Donor Services can use Mass General as a way to also kind of spread some of the best practices across our region, that is a, you know, a great re reciprocal relationship. Um, next would probably be scale. One would also know that, well, okay, we now have a, you know, we have a strong relationship with New England Donor Services. However, we're now speaking more to other OPOs in our outside of our region. And knowing that we can have that reciprocal relationship with New England Donor Services to also you know, partner with us, where it's, um, you know, as far as some of the nuances that we have, some, some of the other sort of challenges around importing of our, um, of our organs and the you know, protocols and the operations around that. And just being able to, as I mentioned before, that reciprocal relationship to scale beyond our, you know, our designated OPO relationship, but also outside. Uh, given that with all of the allocation changes, um, we're now going to probably be talking more often with uh, OPOs that we have never before. So, so uh, with that, it actually brings up a, a second question. Uh, and I'm wondering if you both could comment on this too. You, you probably both have a little bit of a different approach in terms of handling the volume of offers with that big, large volume uh, centers that are coming in. And I know, Luke, you, you've put together a, a call center and Paul, um, can we like compare and contrast the different approaches that you've used for to handle that incoming volume, uh, and how do you help the staff um, deal with that volume, uh, particularly on the donor net side? And Paul, why don't you why don't you go go first? Yeah, we we don't have a call center, but we do have um, a ways to go as far as looking at better managing all of the volume that comes our way. So. Um, you know, when I first came on, we actually took all the calls were internal. And we, as we all know, that is not good for staff and, and it does contribute to burnout. And so we essentially have moved towards a third party um, to manage all of our call. And we've done that for abdominal and we will also do that for thoracic organs. But we haven't quite gotten to that point yet where we have sort of relinquished that um, responsibility as well as the, the call volume. Um, that's just our experience here. And what do you see as the positives of that model and, you know, where you're outsourcing a, a, a critical selection piece and what, you know, what are some of the maybe the negatives with that model? Yeah, the positives are, um, you know, it really, uh, it really causes us to think about our process. Uh, process involved so many different people, process was handed down, and we never really kicked the tires and and say, so kind of, why are we doing certain things? And by incorporating a new uh, third-party vendor, it made us really try to streamline our process. And it really, um, I guess, the additional benefit was now my surgeons can sleep and they're happier. Uh, and so that was one benefit from that. Uh, the other one is around um, really inc incorporating additional people onto the team who might not physically be here. I know now it's um, kind of the name of the game. But a year ago, we were struggling with trying to figure out how do we incorporate a third party vendor uh, where you communicate via text, phone, email. And now it's really more how do we incorporate them into the group? And so that's been um, going great. 
um, and also expanding the, the team. Uh, sometimes you do have uh, some individuals who really are great and you know, they take the brunt of the, the call. Uh, other you know, times we have to sort of adjust along the way. But I would just say, you know, it's really expanding the group and seeing that even though there's a someone who's you know managing all the call, they still are part of our team, and they still are part of all of, all of our efforts around kind of managing the patients, you know, making sure that they're up to date on their research protocols and things like that. Okay. All right, uh, Luke, you've got the floor for the last minute and a half to uh, sure. talk about how you've handling handling. That. Sure. Yeah. So so I mean, you know, we we looked at the idea of these these outsource organizations, and there are some great ones out there, but. Uh, our, our, our practice is sufficiently unique that the conclusion we came to was that that was not going to work from us. And so we built it, uh, we, we, we built it in house. And so we have people on site, uh, uh, 24 seven. We, we actually have, uh, generally speaking, we have four people. So we have two technicians and two, uh, two nurses, uh, and they handle a number of things. So that group handles, uh, uh, handles all of our organ offers. So that's the primary location for all of our, our organ offers as well as communication uh, with OPOs. Uh, they also handle all the transportation logistics for us around flyouts. You know, they manage our our contract with uh, uh, with a jet provider and and so forth. Uh, they also take uh, uh, after hours uh, patient calls. So um, so if a patient is is unwell in, in the middle of the night or on the weekend, they're calling and then also handling uh, an admission or or something like that, as well as a critical lab value, things like that. So uh, so we really put a lot on them, but then we we staff that to four people at a time, uh, which which allows them to handle that that work. There's not always four people there because if we're doing a flyout, uh, the technicians also go support the surgeons on the on the flyout. So um, so during a procurement. Uh, uh, one, two, or occasionally three of those people may be, you know, hopping a plane and and going to a donor uh, donor hospital. So, it, so they're not always here, but it's uh, uh, overall that's the that's the team. Uh, it, you know, it's been successful for us. I think one of the thing one of the challenges, of course, is if when we use those people for call instead of the organ specific folks, they have to uh, amass this broad uh, broad knowledge. They've got to cover all the organs. Uh, there's a benefit to the physicians because it takes them largely off some of the call um, that they have. Uh, but of course it does probably mean they get called a little more clinically than in the days where you had a coordinator from your program who might've been able to handle something uh, that, that, um, that, that, that now has to go to a physician. To be honest, when that happens, I think we're doing a better job of staying in nursing scope. I think some of what the physicians lament that's saying, oh, the coordinators handled that in the past. Every time I get an example of that, it's, it's, it's frankly out of scope for the nurse to have done it in the past. And so I'm okay with the idea that we're, that we're not doing that anymore. But like Paul, with you know, said with the with the outsourcing, you get the benefit of having to standardize everything. And so, if you're going to have a team like that take your call, you've got to set up formal triage protocols because you can't. It's one thing to say, "Oh, well, the, the coordinator who deals with these patients all the time just kind of knows how to do it." Well, no, you can't do that with a coordinator who's covering all of our organ programs, both adult and pediatric. You've got to be able to say, no, this is the actual triage protocol that you follow. This is the organ acceptance protocol that you follow, et cetera. So it's, it has facilitated standardization and, and that kind of, you know, carrot for the organ programs to standardize things when we implemented this was they are not going to take your call <laughs> until you give them the protocols to do it. And, and so really we got some of the benefits that you get from an outside company forcing your hand in that. We did the same thing internally. Great. That's great to hear the similarities in that. Um, I actually misread the clock a little bit. We do have a few more minutes, so uh, I don't have any more questions in the queue, but I would ask you, um, and this is for each of you, what, what question that you thought was going to get asked by our audience, uh, but didn't that you're prepared to, uh, to answer or, or wisdom that you want to provide? Uh, we've got a couple more minutes. So, Paul, if you want to think about that one. Um, That's a really good question. Um, I guess one question that I was prepared to answer um, was around what does Mass General Brigham think about the fact that we have two organ transplant programs at the Brigham and at Mass General? Um, I know it, there's it's a touchy topic. I'm just being transparent, but when you look at the you know the or, 
the programs, you can't, can't help but wonder what's the plan. And so that's the question. Um, don't know the answer yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about for you, Luke? Yeah, I think so. I think as usual, I came uh, wholly unprepared, and so I didn't. I, I hadn't really thought through the things that I uh, that I might be uh, might be asked to uh, uh, to take on that people haven't asked. I think that the, you and the the participants have asked uh, have asked good questions. Um, but I actually, to be honest, one of the things that I that I like to talk about that Paul addressed really well, and I just want to emphasize it. You know, in 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 response to that you know, culture eats strategy question. And, 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 you know, Paul gave exactly the same answer I gave to the, I give to that question when I get it, which is that culture is strategy. And I think that, that, I think the idea that it's culture versus strategy automatically frames you from the very beginning uh, on the, on the wrong side. If your strategy isn't your culture, then you're not running your organization the way you should. Uh, and that's, I think that's where that culture eats strategy concept comes from is, is places that are, uh, frankly, have missed the point from, from the beginning. So uh, just want to echo Paul's excellent answer there. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're going to take this time uh, to wrap it up. I really want to thank our uh, two panelists, Paul and Luke. You did a fantastic job uh, helping us uh, better understand the uh, some of the challenges faced in the transplant side and mitigating uh, some of the risks with organ utilization. Uh, thank you for doing that. Thanks for being part of our program today. Uh, we're gonna take a, a quick 15 minute break. Uh, so for our participants, get a cup of water, a cup of coffee, uh, and we'll see you back here at promptly at 2.55 uh, Eastern time. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs>